we'll actually start praying the prayer of Thanksgiving in Psalm 50 together when we start this meeting. So that's what we will be doing. I will put it up on the screen so we can follow along there. If you have like the, the Coptic Reader app, you can also follow along on your phone. So um, it looks like everyone's pretty much grabbed their food. So let's stand up to pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us give thanks to the beneficent, merciful God, the Father of our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, for he has covered us, helped us, guarded us, accepted us unto him, spared us, supported us, and brought us to this hour. Let us also ask him, the Lord our God, the Pontificator. All did. Actually, no, you come help us, because I can't do this on, on a screen at the same time. All right, then, then just give me your phone, then. <laughs> the presentation mode messes me up. All right, let it. Brought us this hour. Actually, then can you can you? I can only do one. I can't chew. I can't chew and walk at the same time. All right. Let's also ask him, the Lord our God, the Pontificator, to guard us in all peace in all the days of our life. O Master, Lord God, the Pontificator, the Father of our Lord, God and Savior Jesus Christ, we thank you for everything concerning everything and in everything. For you have covered us, helped us, guarded us, accepted us to yourself, spared us, and brought us to this hour. Therefore, let us ask and entreat your goodness, O lover of mankind, to grant us complete this holy day and all the days of our life in all peace with your fear, all envy, all temptation, all the work of Satan, the counsel of the wicked men, and the rising of the enemies, hidden and manifest. Take them away from us and from all your people and from this holy place. But those things which are good and profitable do provide for us, for it is you who have given us authority to sort and upon all the powers of the enemy. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. To the grace, compassion, love of mankind, of your only begotten Son, our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, through whom the glory, the honor, the dominion, and the worship are due unto you, with him and the Holy Spirit, the life giver, who is one essence with you, now at all times and to the ages of all ages. Amen. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your great mercies, according to the multitude of your compassions. Blot out my iniquity, cleanse me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I am conscious of my iniquity, and my sin is at all times before me. Against you have I sinned and done this evil before you, that ye might be found just in your sayings and might overcome when you are judged. For behold, I was conceived in iniquities, and in sin my mother conceived me. For behold, you have loved the truth, and you have manifested to me the hidden and unrevealed things of your wisdom. You shall sprinkle me with hyssop, and I shall be purified. You shall wash me, and I shall be made whiter than snow. You shall make th me to hear, the gla to hear gladness and joy, and the, the humble boys shall rejoice." Turn your face away from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in my inward parts. Do not cast me away from your face and do not remove your Holy Spirit from me. Give to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a directing spirit. Then I will cheat transgressors your ways and the ungodly man shall turn to you. Deliver me from, from blood, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall rejoice of your righteousness. O Lord, you shall open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. For you desire sacrifice, or I would have given it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and humbled heart. These God shall not despise. Do good, O Lord, in your good pleasure to Zion, and let the walls of Jerusalem be built. Then you shall be pleased with sacrifices of righteousness, offerings and burnt sacrifice, and they shall offer calves unto your holy altar. Alleluia. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank this opportunity we may come back into your house. For, Lord, truly you give so much, Lord. You give in abundance, and we thank you for that, Lord. And I ask that you, the same way that you gave in abundance downstairs, Lord, I ask that you also pour your spirit upstairs as well. I ask that you be with us in this meeting, Lord. I ask that you wrestle with hearts. We're going to talk about a topic that sometimes is a challenge, Lord, and I know that you wrestle with us when it comes to these things. For, Lord, you are a good God, and I ask that you just give us the faith to walk in that, Lord, and to respond to that so that it can grow our faith as well and ultimately that you could be glorified. I ask that you give me the gift of prophecy that I may deliver your word to your people, Lord. And I ask, Lord, that you just forgive us our sins, Lord, and that you lift us up. And I ask this of all your saints and our tears, here so we pray one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. See, and that is something that 80% of the congregation will never understand because when you are the guy in front, like you just, you just got a real view of like the fear of like deacon, like deaconhood. 
because it's all fun and games, and I promise you I'm a literate reader. But when you read in front of a bunch of people, it adds a whole other level of stress that probably none of you guys will ever understand. Um, and then it's also, I, all right, so I'm going on a little bit of a side tangent here. But if you're old, like me, and you remember going back and you'd go to different churches or different meetings and you would like you would pray the Igbeya. It was all about like which cover of the Igbeya, right? Like you had like the red cover version of the Igbeya. You had the blue cover version of the Igbeya. You had the red plastic cover of the Igbeya. And all of them had like these different translations and you were really, really used to yours. And so whenever you'd go anywhere else and you're trying to do like another version of the, trans, uh, the Igbeya that's different than the one that you've memorized, then it's, it's always like a hot mess. So, but then Coptic Reader came out and Coptic Reader single-handedly trumped all levels of the Egbeya because it is like the gold standard now, but it's hard to forget what you've, what, you know, what you've been used to for so many years. So now that we got all of that out of the way, um, got to put a message on my heart. Um, and I will tell you, were you guys downstairs for Abuna's announcement? Do you guys all, you guys all heard of that and kind of where we're at on that? Where I'm going to tell you that it hit a little bit different for me because um, I am that guy that realized that we were $200,000 short, okay? If you guys don't know, I'm a banker, um, so I'm the one who's actually in process of doing the, the, church, the church's loan, and um, as you guys know, and I don't know if you guys have noticed, but currently in the world that we live right now, America is going through a little bit of inflation, Right. So everything is starting to get just a little bit more expensive. And when we started this process, like, you know, back in the day, we had all these contractor bids and everything was fine. Um, and actually, I even remember I gave a state of the church a couple months ago and I said, hey, we're good. We have enough money. We don't need to bother anybody. We're going to be all right. And then we got close to kind of inking the contract. They actually sent out for rebids. And um, out of all of the things that have gone up, construction co costs have like skyrocketed. So you're talking about wood, concrete, iron, all of this other stuff that's typically used to build a church um, kind of increase. And I was punching all of the numbers. And yeah, I just I had to make the call to Abuna and I said, hey, Abuna, I think we need about we're about 200 grand short. Um, and I'll tell you why for me it just hit a little bit different is because so I've been the I've been the banker for the church for, I think, pretty much like the last eight years. So every year we're going through the financials. And I remember when we got the loan, um, we did the loan to approve the land purchase. Um, you know, I remember reviewing the financials every year, you know, when we're getting closer and closer doing this loan. And the first thing that kind of hit my heart was as a church, we've raised a lot of money. Um, to be honest with you, I would, I'm actually very Im impressed for the size of the church that we are that we've been able to put up like the, the numbers that we have been putting up. Um, I remember when we bought the land, we bought the land, we, we, ha we didn't even have two years of financial history, but we were able to complete that, that big of a purchase. Um, I remember year after year, we've had like donor matches, you know, where if somebody says, hey, if you, put, if you guys can raise 150, I'll match it. And we've done that successfully year after year. And I was just thinking, um, like at that point, I'm like, man, I thought we were done. Like, how much can we raise? Like, how much can we raise? Like, we're only so many families. Um, and I don't mean that as doubt. I just want to be clear. I don't mean that as doubt. But I was just like, like, we just, like, <laughs> we're going to squeeze out a little bit more. Um, and then literally it was in the same sitting that the story came to mind. And um, we're going to do a good old-fashioned old Bible study today. So I'm going to ask you guys, and um, if you don't have a Bible with pages, take out your electronic Bible, open up to, to Second Kings. Okay, Second Kings, um, I think I told you guys before that the Old Testament to me is something that I just, I just really, really enjoy. And it's because you see God showing up in like real life circumstances. Like in the, in the New Testament, we've got the Gospels, which are amazing stories. You've got the Book of Acts, amazing stories. After that, we get into like the epistles and the teaching. And the teaching is great, but sometimes what's better than teaching is a good old story to like drive a purpose home. So Second Kings 4 is what we're going to turn to. And I'm going to read um, verses 1 through 7. So I'll give everybody a, a second to get to 2 Kings 4.1. <clears throat> it says, A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophet cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your husband feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elijah said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing 
in the house but a jar of oil. And he said, go, borrow vessels from everyone, all your neighbors, empty vessels, and do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you. I like that part. You shall shut the door behind you and your sons and pour it into those vessels and set aside full ones. And when she went out for him, she shut the door behind her and her sons who brought vessels to her. And she poured it out. When it came to pass, when the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. And she came and told the man of God. And he said, go sell the oil and pay your debt. And you and your sons will live on the rest. And glory be to God forever. Amen. And so that, that story kind of came on my heart. So I was like, okay, well, that really doesn't mean anything to me. So let me, let me kind of dive into it, right? Because sometimes God will plant the seed, but we have to do the harvest, right? Like we've got to get in there. We've got to like turn the soil. We've got to water it. We've got to do all of that other stuff. So I said, okay, let's, let's dig into this a little bit because it's a beautiful story. But it, unless it's a beautiful story that's directly, directly applicable to us, it doesn't really mean anything. So the first thing I was thinking about was the fact that what was the state of this woman? Well, the state of this woman was she was a widow, okay? And just in that one, in that one title, it means a lot, right? Because not only was she a widow, but she was a special widow because she was the wife of one of Elisha's, like, prophets, like one of his spiritual children. And especially in the Old Testament, when you see this term widow, what it's actually speaking to, it's speaking to their livelihood, like their ability, and when it says that she's a widow, that is just, that is the Bible reinforcing the fact that she had no ability to pay. And you think about today, how heavy hearted we are for the widow. If you hear of somebody who becomes a widow, especially if you hear of somebody who comes a widow to children or to young children, like your heart breaks for them because you know that that is a very, very tough situation because typically, look, I know it's 2022, but just bear with me here. But typically who's the provider? It's the husband, right? So the fact that she's a widow, you, you already see that she's at a disadvantage, and that was in today's time, okay? If you go back to, to when this story was written, they, her options were very limited. And I'm saying very limited as if, like, maybe, like, if that's if she had options. Like, I don't even think she had options because the legal system right there, it didn't even recognize women. Like, women couldn't declare bankruptcy. Like, they had, like, no rights, a matter of fact, it even says that if she was indebted, would they come and take her for, you know, to pay off the debt? Like, was, would her work be enough to pay off the debt? It was considered worthless. They didn't even want her servitude. Who were they coming for? Her sons, which shows you the state of this woman. And I just thought about, like, this woman's situation was bad. Her earning potential, her earning opportunity, bad. Right? Her state, bad. Her legal situation, bad. The price that she would have to pay if she didn't pay this debt, bad. Like it was, it was bad. And there are some situations where God will allow you to fall into that situation and he doesn't want you to see it a way out. Like he'll put you in a situation where it looks that bad. It looks like there's no possibility of relief. And if you look at this widow situation, I say, I've been there before. Have you been there before in a situation like it, might, it didn't have to be financial, it could have been, but have you ever been in a situation where you said, I don't see an end to this? I don't see what's going to happen on the other side. Like there is no outcome that I can think of that can solve this. I don't know, like 200 grand in a week, like that sort of problem. And, and I love this. Because she approaches Elijah, and the first thing that Elijah asks her is, what do you have? Right? Like, what do you have? And she says, your maidservant has nothing but a jar of oil. And I'm going to tell you that there's a lot of situations in our life where we say, we have nothing but. Because you know what? No matter if we see that there is nothing, there's always something. There's always something there. There's always something that God can use. There's always a way that he can show up. And in this situation, she says, look, I don't have anything. Well, I guess I have this, this jar of oil. 
And even in the original text, it's like even the word that she uses for like this jar of oil, this is not a Costco sized jar of oil. This is, it says that this was actually, it wasn't even like enough to cook with. They said the type of oil that she's referring to in the original text is more like, this is a very small vessel of oil. This is a type of oil that you would usually keep to anoint somebody. Right. So I know that in our houses right now, we probably have one to two thousand little containers of oil of like St. Mary or Medigirgis or that people's given up from, from Egypt. But you can imagine like that sized bottle of oil, maybe even a little bit bigger. Why not? OK. But I think is like, do you ever feel that way about your stuff? Like I have a little. I don't have a whole lot. Like I, I have a little. Um, and I think that, you know, when I was starting to think about like, you know, trying to raise 200 grand in, in the matters of a week, I started to think that that's, that's the way I feel about my finances a lot, right? Like you used to say, well, how much do you have? She said, well, I ha you know, I don't have anything, but I guess I have this. And I think that's why the concept of tithing, let alone giving an offering is so hard. Because a lot of times you say tithe, like, man, I don't know if I've got that margin in my budget, right? And then you start talking to somebody, because right now, when we're talking about coming up with 200 grand in a, in a week, we're not talking about a tithing. We're talking about an offering that that's just, you're just writing a check to write a check. Um, and it seems like our little jar is just not big enough. And there's this whole concept of 90% blessed being greater than 100% unblessed. And that's, that's a walk of faith because it's really hard to wrap your mind around it. it. It challenges us. But the one thing that we hold true to is we hold true to scripture. And this is, I believe, probably one of the most overquoted and underused Bible promises in the Old Testament. Actually, I'll even say even in the New Testament. It's Malachi 3.10. I know you guys have heard it. I'm going to read it again because I don't think we hold on to it. It says, bring all the tithes into my storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for such blessings, that there will be not enough room to receive it. Can you imagine what the church would look like if we actually believed that verse? If we believed that God would meet us at our level of giving and that he would send right back that level of blessing, Think about that. That just, it, it blows my mind because what he says is that there wouldn't even be enough room for you to possess it. There wouldn't even be enough room for you to receive it. And I don't want you guys to think that this is some sort of like investment scheme or if this is like a pyramid thing that's going on here, because if that's the way that you're thinking, then you miss it a thousand percent. Because if you think when God is basically saying that I will pour out blessings upon you and that blessing comes in dollar signs, then I'm going to tell you that you are ready. You're starting at the, you're starting at the wrong point because that is not what God is talking about. So think about it. If he's saying that I will pour out such blessings, what blessings do you think God could be talking about here? And I started thinking about, okay, well, what kind of blessings would I love to have, right? Because I'll be honest with you, we've probably all had a little bit of money and a lot of bit of money, and the reality of it is, is that's probably not blessing. Could it be a little bit of security and a little bit of peace of mind? Yeah, without a doubt. Is it a blessing? Not always. So I started thinking about, you know, some of the blessing peace, if you've ever been without peace, you know how big of a blessing it is. Joy, love, strong faith. Like these are the blessings, right? Not, not, not the zeros in your bank account. What if those are the blessings that he's thinking about? All of the things that money can't buy. Because especially if you have money, you've realized that it only does so much. And I've met a lot of rich people who have lacked all of those things. And I've met a lot of people that would love to write a check to possess it. But that's not the way that God's economy works. But I love what Elisha does here. So he hears the widow and he gives her a commandment. And he tells her, go borrow vessels from everywhere, all of your neighbors. And the beautiful part of what Elijah's doing, it's, he's asking her to do something hard, right? Because what he wanted to see is he wanted to see some evidence of her faith. Not just that she wanted the blessing, right? Like, did she want the blessing? Yeah, she wanted the blessing. She had a real problem. She had a real need. But he says, do you have the faith to walk in a way that makes you believe it? 
Because for a broke lady to walk around asking for vessels is putting her in a very awkward situation. And it also, as a broke lady, asking to borrow things is also inviting awkward questions. So it was this whole weird thing. But she was faithful. And, and her faithfulness brought her to an obedience to do what Elijah commanded her to do. Because she did it in faith. And one of the things that I've realized, I'm only 43 years old, I, I'm not that old, but I will tell you, I'm old enough to realize that I have seen time and time again in my life and other people's lives that God takes people who exercise their faith. Again and again, time after time, story after story. And he wants to make sure that when we step into a situation that is God-pleasing, not just anything, because a lot of people will be like, you know, I walked out in faith and started my own business. You know, well, I don't know if that was God's plan for you or if that was your plan for you. But there's certain aspects of the gospel, of the Bible, that we know is God's plan for us to walk out in faith. And when God invites us to walk out in faith, he walks us out in faith so it can grow. Not so it can shrink, not so it can shrivel, not so it can die. So there's certain situations where he'll put us in a situation because he wants to see our, our faith grow. And God is willing to meet each and every one of us according to our, I want to say according to our faith, but I'll be honest, if I told you that he'll meet us according to our faith, I almost feel like I'm misleading you. And what I want to say is God will be willing to meet us according to our actions. Because it's very easy for you to overstate your faith but it is not very easy for you to overstate your actions. The one thing, you know, wishing, because there's a lot of things that we wish for, okay? But wishing is one thing and willing is another thing. The first, wishing will get you nothing. Willingness will get you everything. See, and that's what I love about the widow in this story, because the widow in this story, she didn't wish, right? What did the widow in this story do? She willed. Like she was told what to do and she, she walked out and she did it. She did exactly what Elisha asked her to. And I love it because he tells her, pour into all the vessels and set aside the full ones. You know, he told this woman, what do you have? She said, I got this small jar of oil. And to pour that out in faith into the borrowed vessels, you think about how that doesn't even make sense. But she did it. And because she did something that didn't necessarily make sense, she, she experienced a great miracle because out of that small jar, she was pouring and all of these other jars became full. And I love the fact that, and I feel like, man, like we can camp here for a long time, but he basically said, I want you to go into that room with your sons and I want you to close the door because where do the miracles usually happen? The miracle usually happens behind closed doors. That's where the beauty happens. That's where the transformation happens. That's where the multiplication happens, right? He says, look, this isn't for other people to see. This is for you and your sons. But a lot of us, what do we want? We want the miracle in front of people. We want the miracle out in front of people, like where everyone sees it. But Elisha's saying that that's not what, dude, behind closed doors, I'm going to tell you that your outside life probably mirrors your inside life. And if you are not happy with your outside life, I challenge you to examine your inside life. Because what happened here is they walked into that room, they closed the door, and God showed up miraculously. And at the end of that, do you know what happened after she closed her door? Because she went in there with what? She went in there with a small jar of oil. But what did she leave with? She left with a whole lot of oil. But I'm going to tell you, it wasn't just a whole lot of oil. She left with a lot of oil. She left with a lot of faith. I guarantee it was a blessing to her. It was a blessing to her sons. It was a blessing for everyone involved. And notice that Elijah had her do it. You know, I'm going to tell you, I, I have some OCD, right? And I, I kind of, I read the story and I said, I wonder if Elijah was tempted just to do it himself. Like, just bring me the jars, bring me, the, bring me what you have, and like, let me just do it. Maybe. But I'll tell you what, do you know why he didn't? He didn't because he knew that there's only a benefit and there's only a blessing 
if she trusts in God, if she sees the miracle herself, that Elisha had to stand out on the sidelines and he needed to watch her do some challenging things. Because a lot of us, we need to experience the, the miracles firsthand. And I will tell you, by the grace of God, um, it, it's kind of nice, right? Because, you know, we've got this meeting here. We've got the meeting on Thursdays. And I hear so many stories from, like, the people that attempt some of these. They say, Pete, you got to hear about what God did. And they'll tell me these situations, and they floor me, right? But I will tell you, as, as, and, and we should find rest in that, that we worship a God who's still working. We worship a God who still does miracles and still shows up in our lives. But I will tell you that I could hear all day long from all of these other people, if I'm not experiencing in my own life, it doesn't mean anything. And that's why for this widow, Elijah said, you do it. Elisha said, you have to experience this. It can't, this can't be an Elisha thing. This has to be a you thing. And the original vessel of oil, again, it was, it was so small, which means that like, you know, that vessel, it just, it just stayed open, right? It just stayed pouring and it was just pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring while it was filling all of these other larger vessels, you know, and I love the fact that he says, hey, when you borrow these other vessels, what was a requirement of them? If you guys look back and you guys remember, what was the requirement of these vessels? He asked her to get what type of vessels? Empty. He said, go get empty vessels because the empty vessels could be filled with new oil. What would it have been like to bring these vessels full? And I'm not even saying fill with oil. It could have been full with whatever, but what would have been the benefit of bringing full vessels? There would have been no benefit because God to fill he needs empty. You know, God still to this day is looking for empty followers. And I'm not talking empty like shallow. I'm talking like empty like we're not full of ourselves. We're not full of our own desires, our own wants, our own, our own things. Right? He's looking for empty followers because empty followers are the ones that he can fill. And he wants to fill us with himself. He has little use for our, our self-filled vessels. Because our own fullness can prevent him from working in the way that he wants to work. And I love it, and it's one of the, the verses I feel like I talk about all the time. It says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness' sake, for they shall be filled. And I always wondered, well, why, why are we not filled? And then maybe it's because we're full of ourselves. He can't fill something that's already full. And I love this part, too, because it says, and when all of the jars were filled, the oil ceased. And I loved this part of verse 6 where she said, now it came to pass when all of the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. Like, bring me another vessel. And I love that because you know what that means? That means that she was still willing to receive more. She was willing. She said, give me more. When she saw the blessings coming, she's like, just keep it coming. Give me more. Give me more. Give me more. Give me more. I don't want the blessings to cease, right? But the sad part is, is the blessing did cease. It ceased because he blessed her in accordance to how much she was prepared for. Because earlier on, she said, this is how much blessing would be enough. Like, if I just get this much blessing, I'll be satisfied. And God said, if this is how much that you're asking for, that's exactly how much I'll give you. But when the time came and that last one was empty, did she say, okay, no, we're good now? This was the last one? When she saw the blessing, she wanted it to keep going. She didn't want to stop. She's like, let the blessing just keep going. But it was given to her in a direct accordance of her faith, according to the number of vessels that she borrowed. And, and don't get me wrong, like, she borrowed enough. She had enough vessels there. It said that it was enough to pay her debts and provi provide for her future. But the crazy thing is, when she started seeing the blessing, she said, I want more. Like, I want more. And she could have had more. But now she has less. She has less than she actually wanted. You know, she was the one that got to decide how much she got. And I believe every single one of us, we do the same thing. Like, we have a certain amount of blessing we want in our mind, right? Like, we decide how much spirituality or spiritual blessings that we want to receive from God. And the, the, really, the reality of it is, he says, I will give you that much. But if you prepare for more, 
if you ask for more, if you're in the process of, you know, the, the story right before this, they're like digging trenches and stuff, right? And it says that they're digging trenches to prepare for the rain. And, and I love it because you think about how big of a faith we want. Like, do you want the faith where you're just going to say, hey, this is how much I want. You know, this is how much I'm going to get. Or like, are we going to learn from this woman and say like, no, 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 no. I want, I want bigger. Like, I, I want more. Like, I want as much as you can give me. And, and I challenge you because the fact is, is that God is willing to give you all of that. If you hunger and you thirst for righteousness, you will be filled. If you look at this story, it was this woman's action that stopped it from being filled even more, right? And I will tell you, a lot of the times our blessings are little because our prayers are little, because our actions are little, right? If we want different spiritual lives, then we should pray more. Our actions should be more. Something has to change, but it's not from God's part because God already told us, I am willing. I will bless. I will fill. I will do anything. But he's looking at us. He says, how much do you want? How much do you want? The question is, how many jars are we going to collect? How much work are we going to put into this? And I love this because when she goes back, um, Elisha tells, he says, go sell the oil, pay your debt, and you and your son shall live on the rest. And, you know, you compare this lady's situation now to where it was at the beginning of the story, everything's different. Everything's different. She went from losing everything, including her own children being sold to, as slaves to having a secure future. How? It doesn't even make sense. Do you think it was easy? Do you think it was easy for this lady? I guarantee it was not easy for this lady. This lady had to go and hit up all of her neighbors. And, you know, back then they probably all knew that she was broke, probably all knew that she was in debt, probably all knew she was about to lose her sons into servanthood, you know, and she's basically saying, hey, can I borrow a, a jar? Or should, oh, and then, you know, you know, all right, I guess yeah, I got this one jar. No, no, no. Actually, I kind of need more, right? Like, can I get all of your jars? Do you think that was easy on this lady? Of course it wasn't easy. She had to do hard things, right? But I want to make sure that you guys realize that this was not a passive blessing. This was not like the man who was healed after 38 years after lying by a pool because Christ just came and spoke it into him, right? No, she had to work for it. She needed to ask to borrow the jars. Who filled them? Her and her sons. They actually had to put in work. And God only knows how long that oil was flowing. But they, they needed to put in work. And then after she put in the work, guess what? She needed to find out where like the, the local swap meet was, right? And she needed to, did, did Elisha tell her, just bring me the, the jars of oil and I'll buy it from you? No. He says, you need to go out and you need to hustle and you need to sell it. So you think about everything that she did here right? There was work. But you think about the blessing that she received. You think about how, how God met her where she was, where she was and where she was at the end of the story. Well, what were the blessings? She got to keep her sons, right? I'm going to tell you her future, right? He basically said, you know, so now you don't have to sell your sons. You get to keep your sons. He said, hey, financially, you're good now right? You can pay off all your debtors. And it even said there's enough money for you and your sons to live on afterwards. So she had financial stability. But what was the greatest blessing in all of it? Everyone's kind of nodding, but nobody wants to say it. Her faith. Do you think this lady's life was the same again? I guarantee you it wasn't. Her faith grew like you couldn't even believe. And I think that's the blessing. That's the blessing that God, God says, try me, try me. You know, I, I'm going to pour out blessings. And I think we cut ourselves way too short if we think bless, a blessing has like a dead president's face on it. There's so much more than that. You know, I have to be honest, a couple months ago, um, not a lot of people were in it, but I gave this, uh, this talk for like the state of the church, right? And it came to our finances. And, and I was talking about how faithful God's been with us, right? And I was looking at like the chart graphs and how much our, gearing, our giving goes up year after year after year. You know, we talked about, trusting God, committing to the tithe, and how this is a spiritual blessing that always gives out like a ton of actual blessings on it. And one of the things that I remember I kept saying all over again, because I believe it would like, you know, all of my heart, and that's no different today than it was three or four months ago. But one thing I kept saying was God doesn't need your money. And I still believe that God does not need your money. Like we'll be fine. The church will be built. Um, I hope that we get the blessing for it because that money is going to come one way or another. But I hope that HTC, the congregation of HTC gets the blessing for that. 
right? But it was funny because a couple of weeks later, I got a call from the guy who, who collects the, the, the money box, right? And, and he called me and he says, hey, Pete, I think they believed you. And I said, like, what part? He's like, the part where you say God doesn't need your money. <laughs> so I was kind of like, what do you mean? And then he was like, we've actually had a huge drop off in tithing. So I don't know if people are sending it other places or if people just felt that there was better places for their money to go. Um, he's like, to be completely honest with you, he was just like, and the reason that I'm, I'm prompting this is I just, I just cleared out the money boxes and it was on a Sunday. He's like, I just cleared out the money boxes. Do you know how much money was in it? I said, I don't know. He said, $47. A church our size, the money box at the end of it, $47, right? He's also the lowest we've ever seen. So maybe I thought that I screwed up the message or people took it the wrong way. Um, but I'll be honest with you, I got sad, right? And I got sad not because, you know, we couldn't pay our mortgage. No, we got our mortgage. We got money in the bank. We're fine and all of that stuff, right? Do we need about a couple hundred grand? Yeah, God's going to send it, right? I got sad because I felt like the people from HTC were not going to receive the blessing. This is a clear source of blessing, and we were not going to receive the blessing. So the spiritual blessings. So I pray that we're a church that we trust God. I pray that we're a church that sees a need and we jump all over it. Like, I want us to act like Egyptian people when you go out to dinner with them. You know what I mean? Like, when that bill hits the table, you've got like 14 credit cards coming out and everyone's trying to pay it, right? Like, that's how I want us to act when it comes to our church, right? When it comes to our need. Because we want the blessing. And we want to we wanna aggressively go after the blessing. I'm going to say back to this widow, do you think that she was stingy moving forward whenever she felt that there was a need or maybe if somebody else was in need? Like it's not written in the Bible, but I can almost guarantee you that she wasn't, right? Because she saw that God met a need in her life. She saw that God stepped up big somehow in her life. And I guarantee you she was quick to give back and I guarantee you she was quick to help others. So on that note, we need to come up with about 200 grand, okay? Okay. Now, I'm going to tell you something that I know that there's probably people that we can hit up and they can write us a check for 200 grand. And it wouldn't be, you know, it might be a challenge, but I, I think that we can definitely do it. But my question is, is why wouldn't this be a group effort? Why wouldn't this be an opportunity that we can all step into this and receive the blessing from it? Because I believe that that's what God is calling us to. And I actually believe that that's why we are in this situation, because he's giving us an opportunity to step into this blessing. So... I pray that each one of us does what they can. Doesn't do more than they can, but just does what they can. And then when we think about how God's faithful with us and everything he's done with us, that we have an opportunity to respond with that same amount of faithfulness that he's always shown to us. And glory be to God forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you because we know that you pour out blessings. We know that you never leave us, Lord. We know that you're faithful. But Lord, I ask that you just make us more faithful. Because Lord, sometimes it's hard to take the steps. And sometimes dire need pushes us out of our comfort zone, Lord. And I feel at least as a church, that's kind of where we are right now. So Lord, I ask you just put it on our hearts. Maybe every single person, Lord, even, even if we're giving it 50 to to $100, Lord, even if it's the smallest things, but that you bless it. But Lord, I ask that you just challenge us when it comes to our giving, that, you will, that each one of us will settle on that right number, that each one of us, Lord, will have kind of a story with you in all of this, Lord, that the same way that this woman, Lord, you know, when you blessed, it changed everything, Lord. I ask the same thing with us, Lord, that when we, when we take a step in faith, and for a lot of us that this offering, Lord, this might be a step in faith. It might be hard, but I ask that you respond by pouring out blessings as well. And it's not about the money, Lord. It's about how faithful you are in every aspect of our life. So, Lord, I ask that you be with this church, Lord. I ask that you be with the building of this church, not just the walls, Lord, but the congregation, because if we are growing in number, but we are not growing in spirituality, Lord, what have we accomplished? So, Lord, I ask that you pour out your spirit, Lord. I ask that you pour out your blessings, that it just fortifies us. I ask that you have mercy on us, Lord. You forgive us our sins, Lord, and that you strengthen us, that we don't return back to them. 
and that you hear these prayers live in the session of all your saints and martyrs. Here's where we pray one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for as the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so this is more housekeeping just because the, the treasurer specifically asked me to address three things, okay? Number one, online givers, we love you, but you charge, it costs us 3%. So on a $200,000 match, let's just say that a large percentage of that went um, online, that, that can cost anywhere between like, you know, that can cost up to $6,000 in just merchant card processing fees. Um, second thing is, we kinda gotta come up with this money kinda fast. God loves the online, the, uh, the online bill pay people, who I am first, um, but online bill pay takes about 10 days. So if you were thinking about doing it through your online bill pay, we're gonna miss it. So, um, so the third thing, he just encouraged good old school, write a check, put it in the box, and we'll be good to go. All right, sound good? Thank you, guys.